practical level, here's what I see probably week in and week out in the time that I counsel people, is people who don't know how to love well. That's, for me, from what I see in my little version of the emergency room, is people who don't know how to love well. They know they love. They say they love. So I'm speaking recently. This is something that goes over and over again. Uh, I, I've seen this my entire adult life. And it's a, um, uh, a, uh, a wealthy, successful man. These are almost always men, but sometimes it's been women, who have their, want their children to do something a very specific way. And um, they say that if they don't do it this way, that they're not love, they, don't, they don't love in return, that they're not uh, making the parent proud of them, and they don't deserve anything that the parent has, has earned. Now, by the way, I'm not making a judgment on how one should bequeath one's money. I think there are some times if you bequeath money to a certain child, the child would, would spend the money recklessly and not do any good with it. So I'm not talking about the wisdom of what one does with one's money. But the attitude of um, that I love my child by telling them what to do and letting them know if they do what I tell them to do, that I will reward them. So I push the parent a little bit and I say, what, what other love is there? And what I realize is sometimes these people are just bereft of more words. And when I talk to the kid, they say, well, yeah, my dad criticizes me and he pushes me and calls me in, but I know he loves me. I say, well, how do you know he loves you? He says, well, he says so. And what I realize is there are some people, I mentioned this a little bit earlier today, at least I, uh, obliquely, there are some people that I think the part of the brain that matches the spiritual reality of love is just underdeveloped. Is a part of the brain that can feel em empathy, capacity for intimacy, can withstand pain in conflict, where you stay and don't flee, that you can admit that you're wrong, and that you truly care about the soul of another human being. You want to be of service to that soul. I really believe this is, a, this is not only a spiritual reality, but actually is part of the human brain. And that's, in my talking about our relationship with each other, why it's so important because there are many people I've met that, are, that, are, that fear intimacy, um, that don't know how to love, because they, actually because they were never taught, which means they have a capacity for it. I think the emanatory power is real, but it's so underdeveloped that they actually need deep instruction and deep contemplation and meditation in order to expand that part of, of their brain. This is mind-changing brain. So I know sometimes when I've, uh, when I've talked to parents and spouses and talked about love, they say, oh, I love my child, but however they tell me the thing. And I, I, I use a few uh, uh, different metaphors. You've heard me use them many times, but I'll tell you my favorite one that I use for myself and other people. I say the following. Um, uh, as a congregational rabbi, especially at my uh, previous congregation, I was an assistant rabbi for five years, and then in the early years of Oratora, I've mentioned many times, I supported myself by officiating at funerals. And I got to sit in many living rooms after a person died, heard many stories about how people lived. A lot of people live badly and live poorly, not monetarily. And I remember saying to the family, look, tell me the truth. We'll go outside and I'll put a, I'll put a good shine on it, but I got to know the truth. I would hear awful stories of misused lives and misused words. I'd go out and do the best job that I could. And sometimes there would be some pre-funeral, post-funeral counseling but after many years and hundreds of funerals, I, I felt just a very deep grief inside myself of how much life was misused and wasted, how much love was not achieved, and how words were so terribly, terribly misused. And so what I realized sometimes when I'm talking to a person, they really think they love, but they just don't know how. It's such a strange thing. Everybody assumes you know how to love. When you go out and, and, and try to learn a musical instrument, the, within the first seconds, you know you don't know how to play. You try to play a, dis, a sport that requires any kind of physical skill. You realize you can't play the sport, but everybody assumes there are masters at love and, by extension, justice, truth, and beauty. All right, so for that reason, I think, when one says, well, there's this reality called truth, he, uh, love, justice, truth, and beauty, he focuses on beauty, um, can a human being be educated to love, to be more just and righteous, 
to understand what truth is and experience the beautiful? Can a person be trained? And I think yes. Nearly everybody who's been willing to take instruction is able to love better. And there are specific ways to learn to love better. Now, here's the interesting thing. The mind has to commit to it for the brain to change and the soul to understand. That's why many people just object deeply. I was, uh, um, just say another anecdote, um, I'm counseling a, a young man <clears throat> who's uh, being, uh, I would say, objectively speaking, maybe not very well treated in his employment and furious about it and is trying to learn a skill of not angering, although the other people, objectively speaking, might deserve his anger, meaning he's right to be angry, but it's not right to be angry. It's going to be very destructive for him. And he can't tell the distinctions between an appropriate emotion, meaning in our animal self, when someone frustrates you and hurts you and humiliates you, the proper inner response is anger. It just it produces such little good. And what it means to work with consciousness to actually subdue something that is natural and appropriate something that is supernatural, which is restraint, perspective, philosophic wisdom, and activating other parts of the brain as opposed to the anger brain. And I, as I'm talking to the person, I realize the person is completely resistant to the idea that he should do something supernatural. Okay? That his natural state of being is what's right. Other people have to change. And I say, look, on some level, you're right. On another level, you're going to destroy yourself and everything around you if you keep this up. Right? So I think the brain in the natural state gets us through some things, but in others, it doesn't. 